Uh, this, in, in contract cases, you usually take contingency. As a lawyer, you would take a contingency in, in a personal injury case or something like that. But no, he, he talked the Hopis into uh, the one-third of, of the contract value for himself. Well, that ties in then with something which we'll see on the slideshow in a minute, the fact of the immediate reason for the... Um, U.S. government coming in to relocate these people. They're saying they can't get along. It's all kind of strife. But in the uh, slideshow, they say all this was a fabrication of a public relations firm in Utah. Now, was this lawyer tied in with this? this oh, part of an effort? I, I, I'm, I'm sure, sure he was, either directly uh, or indirectly. Uh, there's been a very sad history of, uh, of in fact, well, even Mormons uh, dealing with the, with the uh, Navajo and Hopi. And uh, they've certainly taken advantage of those people. Well, has there been friction then? Between the Navajo and the Hopi? Uh -huh. that well, that's true. That's not with, uh, again, the, the, any friction that came, came as a result of these white man placed tribal councils. Uh -huh. you know, the tribal councils, which were not, in fact, the legitimate governing uh, branch of the tribes. But, uh, but rather a creation of Washington, so they would have somebody with whom to negotiate. But there were certainly, I know that the PR firm was talking about bullets flying here and there, and, and that, uh, you know, there was no deaths, there were no bullets flying to anybody's recollection, unless they were shooting deer or something like that. But they certainly, the Navajos were not shooting Hopi, and Hopis weren't shooting Navajos, that, uh, any of the information that I found. Well, let's see this tape slideshow, and then we'll ask you some more questions uh, after it's over with. All right. Okay. In our traditional tongue, we have no word for relocation. To relocate means to disappear and never be seen again. Since the beginning of history, the people, or Diné, as they call themselves, have lived on this sacred land. They have remained in harmony with their environment by practicing a way of life that is as old as time itself. According to the Diné emergent story, the people were given stewardship over the land by the Creator. They were instructed by the Creator to always preserve and protect the natural balance of nature. The people's relationship to this land is an integral part of their religion. In Diné Bata, there is no separation between religion and existence. Their daily life is a religious expression. Diné religion and culture have survived numerous assaults by white society. Their history and traditions have been passed from generation to generation, ensuring the survival of the Diné people. However, with the passage of Public Law 93-531 in 1974 and the resulting relocation program, the people's very survival is now being threatened. This is the Four Corners area, with the Navajo or Diné Reservation in red. The area comprising the blue rectangle was established by the federal government in 1882 as a reservation for the Hopi and all such Indians as designated by the Secretary of Interior. Prior to the issuance of the 1882 executive order, both Diné and Hopi were living on this land. In 1936, the yellow area was established as the exclusive Hopi reservation. Within this area lie the three mesas where the majority of the Hopi live. The rectangular area, primarily inhabited by Diné, had evolved as a shared use area for the Hopi and Diné. The people have peacefully coexisted on this land since before the creation of the United States solving their differences in a traditional fashion without external interference. The passage of the Navajo Hopi Land Settlement Act in 1974 was the culmination of an intense effort by the federal government, the Hopi Tribal Council, and multinational energy interests. At stake was who would control the 1.5 million acre joint use area and the estimated 22 billion tons of low sulfur coal underneath it. In addition to coal, the joint use area contains uranium and other economically valuable minerals.
Congressional action was based on a belief that a land dispute or range war was underway between the Navajos and Hopis living in the joint use area. However, according to a Washington Post expose, the so-called land dispute was a creation of Evans and Associates, a Salt Lake City-based public relations company representing both the Hopi Tribal Council and a consortium of energy corporations. The Land Settlement Act, or Public Law 93531, mandated the partition of the joint use area into exclusive Hopi and Navajo areas. Lands partitioned to the Navajo are shown here in white, while Hopi partition lands appear in red. As a result of this Washington-imposed partition, 10 to 15,000 Navajo and 100 Hopi found themselves on the wrong side of the fence now the targets of a forced relocation program. The traditional people of a joint use area, both Hopi and Diné, deny that this alleged range war ever existed. They cite a long history of peaceful coexistence, including intermarriages and active trading between the two peoples. In the spring of 1986, four young Indian men from the Big Mountain Survival Camp were arrested while confronting a Bureau of Indian Affairs fencing crew. The crew was erecting a barbed wire fence which, if finished, would have desecrated sacred religious sites. Following the arrests, the religious leaders of a sovereign Hopi village of Hotvilla released a statement expressing their support for the actions of the four men. The leader said, Public Law 93-531 was created to divide our land and all original people of this land. It was created without the consultation or consent of the sovereign traditional Hopi leaders and directly violates all teachings and practices of Hopi religion. The federal government, in its drive to move the people, has undertaken a number of coercive measures designed to force people from their homes by destroying their ability to support themselves. These federal measures include a ban on new home construction or repair and a 90% livestock reduction program, which directly threatens the Diné way of life. As the people's means of support has been removed, many Diné have relocated, believing that they have no options other than to surrender or starve. Under Washington's relocation program, Diné people are given three options. One, to relocate to other areas of the already overcrowded Navajo reservation, two, to relocate to a reservation border town, entering a foreign and alien culture, or three, to relocate to the so-called new lands, hundreds of miles from the joint use area. These new lands were acquired under the 1980 amendments to Public Law 93-531. The new lands are situated in a region that in 1979 was the scene of the worst radioactive spill in U.S. nuclear history. On the morning of July 16, 1979, a tailings pond burst, spilling 90 million gallons of radioactive water and hot solids into the Puerco River Basin. The Puerco River Basin travels through the northern quadrant of the new lands. According to the Diné resistance, all of the federal government's proposals are unacceptable because they require the abandonment of their sacred homeland. Thousands of Diné have chosen to openly resist the relocation program. They have vowed to resist relocation in defense of their religion and this sacred land. According to the Diné, they were placed on this sacred land by the Creator, Meso of Big Mountain. We were all placed to live in balance with every living being, with everything that was created on Mother Earth. Our forefathers have taught us that we were all placed on this land between the four sacred mountains. All of our sacred songs and prayers are within our four sacred mountains. The teachings of our ancestors are here in our sacred songs and prayers. 
These songs and prayers are part of the ceremonies. They are our teachings and our way of life. This is our religion. This is what connects us to the land. The Diné people's survival on this land depends in part on their livestock. Again, made so. Our Creator has given us livestock as a part of our way of life. From the sheep, we use almost everything. We use the wool for weaving rugs, the skins for bedding, and the meat for our food. The only things that are thrown out are the bones. Through sheep herding, Diné children learn about the land and the sacred places. Meat from sheep called mutton is a central component of a Diné diet. Given the importance of livestock to the survival of a Diné, Washington's stock reduction program can only be viewed as another aspect of the war against the traditional Diné people. Even the devastating impact of the federal government's livestock reduction program has not deterred the traditional Diné from resisting this latest threat to their survival. The Diné people use dry farming techniques to grow corn and other vegetables in their sacred desert homeland. In addition to being a major part of a Diné diet, corn is also used in religious ceremonies. Big Mountain resident Jane Bayaketi. My mother taught me the value of raising livestock. This is a responsibility that is passed on to us from our forefathers. We must maintain, protect, and carry out this livelihood, even if it has to be a painful struggle at times. Dene Elder Joe Benali. I was born into a family that only raises livestock. I had raised my family with livestock. The sheep gives us food and wool. The sheep give us joy seeing them in the corral. The sheep sound nice to my ears. I have never had a modern job. I only know livestock. Since the beginning, the people have survived by practicing the Diné sacred way of life. Five generations of women from the Many Beads family are involved in resisting the relocation program. They live in the Big Mountain region of the Joint Use Area. Within the Many Beads family, the religious teachings of the Diné have been passed from generation to generation. Jenny Many Beads is 102 years old. Her daughter, her granddaughter and her great-granddaughter, and her great-great-granddaughter. Five generations of Diné history. The Many Beads family, along with other Diné families, are currently the lead plaintiffs in a lawsuit that challenges the constitutionality of Washington's relocation program. The suit seeks to have Public Law 93-531 declared unconstitutional as a violation of the First Amendment guarantee of the free exercise of religion. Since the relocation program was first announced, elders from throughout the Joint Use Area have vowed that they will resist this effort to destroy their way of life. Ruth Benali of Big Mountain. <laughs> When the time comes, if we don't have any choice, we are going to use our fists. No matter how small I am, I'll fight all the way to the end. They told us to get rid of our livestock. Now they are trying to get rid of us. They are trying to kill us. Big Mountain Elder Aski Betsy. <laughs> But the white man does not understand that we are connected to our land and cannot be treated as parcels to be distributed like the U.S. mail. 
Even though you have done injustice to us in the past, we were loyal enough to you to have a lot of our own sons fight for you in wars and strengthen your fight to keep this land a free nation. And yet the meaning of free here is in question because we are being denied our rights and wishes to live in harmony as we always have for generations. Elder Kishé from Big Mountain. Shady. I do not like relocation, stock reduction, or fencing. Big Mountain is for the people who live here. It holds our prayers. We pray without ceasing for our survival here, not somewhere else. We have no thoughts of relocation. Pauline White Singer of Wide Ruins, west of Big Mountain. In our traditional tongue, we have no word for relocation. To relocate means to disappear and never be seen again. Mark Charlie of Tisto in the southeastern corner of the joint use area. <laughs> The Rinesh sacred homeland consists of sacred mountains, springs, river, animals, and plants. The sacredness was set forth by spiritual prayers and songs, which are preserved within our traditional legends. I cannot abandon these sacred things. That is why I cannot relocate. But it is not just the elders who are resisting. For the Diné people, there is no separation between land, life, and religion. Following the birth of a Diné baby, the umbilical cord is buried and an offering of the afterbirth is made to a young tree. A cradle board is then fashioned from a nearby tree. These rituals form a spiritual bond between the newborn child and the land. They also introduce the child to the spiritual beings of the area. Coal mine Mesa medicine man, Jack Hitothali. <laughs> Our offering places are sacred to us, and the spiritual beings take care of us. We know the land and the spiritual beings here, and they know us. If we would relocate elsewhere, we would not be known by the spiritual beings there, and we could not perform our ceremonies. We would not be able to survive. The Hogan is the traditional home and a place of ceremony for the Diné, the nexus between the individual, the land, and the entire culture. Mosquito Springs Elder May So. A ceremony can only be performed in a Hogan. The Hogan has four main poses which represent the four sacred mountains. The top of the Hogan represents Father Sky. The bottom part is Mother Earth. Between these two are all living beings. In our ceremonies, all of our songs and prayers are within the Hogan. A Diné Hogan is never abandoned unless it is struck by lightning or a person dies from causes other than old age. A hogan that is passed down through the family is said to be blessed by the generations. The land is the Diné people's altar. It is their place of worship. Unlike the Judeo-Christian religions which focus on people or events, American Indian religion, and in particular the Diné religion, focuses on the place where an event occurs. Therefore, the religion is land-based and cannot be practiced at other places. 
Diné people communicate with the holy people through offering places or